Hello. So my name is Simo, and here's Teemu as well. Hi. Yeah, we are going to be talking about uh, data formats next. Uh, so uh, now that we have handled, like, we have the basics of, of uh, what we are going to be using uh, the tools. We have NumPy, we have Pandas, and we have uh, plotting tools, so the Matplotlib side. Uh, now we usually want to, like, figure out how do we get some stuff into our system, like some outside stuff. Uh, data uh, and for that you usually need to choose a correct data format and uh, yes yeah, so if we switch to the my screen we can look at the data formats in a bit more detail so what is a data format so usually um, uh, it can mean two things two separate things it can mean the data structure uh, so, or how your data is organized, it, like how the uh, op uh, the program sees your data, like how it's organized in memory, uh, what kind of objects it is, like that kind of stuff, how it's organized in your code and in your, um, you, yeah, in your code and in the memory of the computer. And then there's also the file format. So how how the data is stored when it's stored into a disk. And these are like both da data formats, but they're a bit different. Like the other one is like, what is what is the format when you are working on the data? And what is, what is the format when you're not working on the data, but it's, it's waiting to be worked on? And if you look at a few examples, uh, so let's consider this uh, random data frame that uh, I have here. So basically it, it contains some strings it contains some time values it contains some integers and then it contains some floating point numbers so this is like a typical like you might have a data format that describes uh, well it can uh, describe basically whatever and if we create this we can see that and you look at uh, with this data set info command we can see that there is uh, like a lot of entries, 100,000 entries here. Some of them are objects, some of them are date times, some of them are integers, and some of them are floating point values. So we have different uh, kinds of objects inside this data frame. So what is the data format for this kind of a data frame? Well, the data format is tidy data. We talked about tidy, tidy data yesterday. So in tidy data, we have a variable that is uh, that can have, have its own data type. It's stored as a column. And then we have observations uh, in the rows. So we have multiple of these uh, columns that with different data types. Um, let's consider another example. So in here, we I create like a simple NumPy array. Uh, so let's create this. And we notice here that we have an ND array, so NumPy uh, uh, array with certain shape, certain strides. We were talking about the strides yesterday. Uh, we noticed that it's a, it's a contiguous block of data. So it's one, one big block in the memory, and it has a data type of floating point numbers. So what is the data format for this uh, data? It is a block basically block in a memory so multi-dimensional like array of course in like what was yesterday talked about uh for the computer this is only one dimensional like a block of memory so it's it's one big uh block of memory but using the shape and the strides parameters it will interpret it as a multi-dimensional array if it needs it to be that kind of a uh yeah, if it if it needs that, well, wouldn't it be nice? Like we have two different uh, data types here, our data form, uh, data structures. Wouldn't it be nice if both of these uh, could be stored in a way uh, that would like stored to the disk in a way that would retain the same structure? So what I mean by that is that if we save this 
like we save this uh, multi-dimensional array or we save our tidy data data frame we would probably want to store it in a data format or file format that has a uh, has the same kind of like a structure inside of it uh, so that we can uh, keep the format as intact as possible and this is very important when you are coming are going towards big data like big data is all the rage well has been for the last 20 years and in in the more data you start to um, have the more important it becomes to keep your data in the similar kind of uh, a format uh, in memory as is it is in the disk because that makes all of the accesses and like you don't need to do any conversions when you're reading the data or when you're writing the data it makes all of the accesses and everything much faster and easier uh, so how do you choose a file format well the most important thing is like you should know that there is no uh, format that is good for every use case so if you look at this this uh excellent comic from xkcd you notice that uh like how how standards usually proliferate so so you have one standard and then somebody else thinks that okay like my use case isn't supported by this standard and then they create another standard and now you have two standards and so forth and this is the same thing for file formats there is no one file format that rules them all there is no file format that can uh like satisfy every use case and be efficient and fast and everything like that so you usually need to choose a file format based on uh, based on a number of factors and a good like at least to keep in your head it might be that uh, you might want to choose a file format uh, that is easy to use for your use case that is fast for your use case you might want to choose a file format based on what other people are using. So usually there might be some frameworks, there might be some uh, other people who might be using certain file format, and you might want to choose based on that uh, alone, because then you can easily collaborate and you can use their tools uh, to do your analysis. Uh, one good thing to keep in mind is that while you're working with the data, is that do you need the code to be or do you need the data to be human readable while you're working on it so for example here when we're working with jupiter we get human readable view of the data when we use pandas for that but the data is in memory it's it's not it's in bytes in the memory so we use code to to uh, get access to that data but we don't need to understand how the data is stored, basically. So the data is is stored in in a, like as bytes in binary format in the computer memory. But we can access it using uh, pandas. And if you don't need to actually look at the file itself, uh, you might need not need to store it in a human readable format. Um, because well, if you want to uh, use computers to. Uh, to do like analysis on the data, you probably want the uh, data to be in a computer understandable format so that the computer can easily work on it. Uh, and the last question is that, is this for archiving or is this uh, just for now where you're working on it? If you want something for archiving, that might be a completely different data format than what you want to use when you're working on the data because the archive formats might not be efficient uh, whereas some of the other formats might be more efficient if you like storing temporary data uh, here i i noticed that you use the word choose or like select mm. uh, a data format and i was thinking is there can you come up with a like choose from a set of pre-existing data formats do you is there a scenario that you would actually have to kind of like come up with your own data format or uh, or have you or better better phrased have you encountered such a situation in your work yeah. or in your studies or yeah that's a, that's a really great question so so 
I I'd say that I haven't ever encountered a situation where I've had. Well, I have once written like a data format that was basically a bad data format, but it, like it was basically <laughs> yeah. like a like a change changes to uh, some a NumPy array. But but I haven't written the file format itself. Uh, I have written a convention, may, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, choose which kind of like names to use, which kind of uh, how to store the data. Like that is also like a file format. If you choose certain conventions, if you choose like okay, the data will always be stored with the name data or something like that. You choose a convention and. Many of the data forms that we are going to be talking, uh, so some of the data forms we are going to be talking about today, they also are basically conventions that are built upon certain, uh, certain like already existing technology. They're just like more well defined. So in yeah. many cases, you might end up like choosing that. Okay, you choose to. Uh, use certain uh, names you choose to have a certain structure but you might still use the same kind of like data set writers uh, to to write the data actually to the disk but yeah I, i'm i haven't encountered myself a situation where i have written like a like a <laughs> writer like a data writer from from scratch in c or something like that uh, yeah. because I, yeah like usually it's it's uh it's not you don't end up with anything good uh but but it, it yeah that's a really great question and i'm not yeah. completely certain what would be the correct answer yeah exactly because uh, yeah it's it's about your experience and and i have a very similar experience that it's i have never had to go like deep into making my own data format or or implementing it so it's basically a question as it very as it very often is that it's a question of like best practices and what what is the community practices and usually you have some kind of like a collection of standard standard uh, solutions and then you choose the one that kind of fits your use case okay but yeah that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's uh, look at few of the data formats. So here's a big list. You can like click on any of these to to go to the specific uh, entry. There's other different factors that uh, we've been using to to like uh, set certain like uh, which which is a good use case for whatever uh, situation. But um, let's let's look at few of them. Uh, like the the most common ones. So Temo, if you want to uh, grab the screen, we okay. can look at uh, pickles first. So there is already uh, in the HackMD, I noticed there's a question that is basically the first question, or first like major downside of, of a pickle, uh, which is that pickles aren't secure. But... Um, if you if you show the key features of pickles, uh, uh, yeah, here, yes, yeah. a bit bit below, yeah, yeah, there. Uh, uh, so yeah, my, so my scrolling doesn't work very very well. Ah, oh, yeah, there. So uh, the <laughs> the pickle format is basically like Python's own like this serialization library. So serialization means that you want to take some object and then you want to like just store it into the disk. Uh, so, so pickle is a format that Python uses. So you can you put arbitrary Python objects uh, into these files. Um, this is this is very good if you want to like do debugging or something. You want to just see what your object has inside of it. Uh, but do, uh, but it has major down, downsides. The the biggest downside is that it's very unsecure because it's an arbitrary Python object, right? Like you could store whatever kind of an object there that when you when it's loaded, it will like run arbitrary code on your machine. So mm -hmm. you should never use it to share anything with anybody and you shouldn't uh, load pickles from untrusted sources. But uh, if you have like, a, like, let's say you have a code that crashes and you don't know, you want to store like some sort of like 
state of variables and certain variables before the code crashes and have like some sort of like debugging or what is the state of the system of course you could use a debugger which is preferable but if you have like if you're not there or if you want to like uh just just store my object so that i can continue where i left off uh you can use pickles uh and yeah let's let's try uh saving some random stuff in a pickle so if if demo okay yeah. so uh what i did uh when uh you were running your code i ran it as well so this is the same code i run above. yeah so, so now i take this pickle code Yes. So with pickle, you need to use these with, you need to open the file pointer uh, before you, you write into it. And then you basically dump the, the Python object there. And then you can do the same thing to read it. So, so if you, so, you run it. So here is the import and here is the write operation. And here is the then loading the return. Yes. Okay. So. So pickles are, uh, yeah, the one one big downside of pickles is that if you like have a huge array that is in your memory and you store it as a pickle, it's basically the same size as the original array, and uh, and it, it when you load it, it will use that huge amount of memory. So if you like do analysis on a on a big memory system and then transfer the results to your laptop and try to read it as a pickle, you might like run out of memory and do kind of all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. So it's basically like like it's easy, but not very. Uh, it's not encouraged uh, for for like long term use. But let's try it out. You can try it out yourself. So we have first exercise here uh, of how to use uh, pickle, and let's have like a quick five minute exercise. This is these exercises are very like very small and very easy to do. Mm. So, uh, I'll. Take the screen for a second. So if you look at the exercise one, uh, create some arbitrary Python object. And then um, you can have a string or a list or whatever, and then pickle it and read the pickled object back and check if that matches the original one. So let's have uh, like five minutes on this. So like. Uh, 12.33, let's continue. Yep. Yeah. We're back. Yes. So hopefully you managed to do it. Uh, if not, then, well, there's lots of data forms to go through, so we don't, we won't use too much time on the solution. But if you look at the solution, it's pretty simple. It's basically what was, uh, like, what we were running previously. Uh, but let's uh, now will... jump. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry. I will grab the screen. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So let's, let's focus on, on more, like, Pickle is nice and all, but let's focus on actual data formats uh, so that we can use that more represent like uh, our data. And in this case, let's focus on tidy data. So if we have this kind of data in pandas where we have the columns and then we have the uh, variables in the columns and then we have the observations in the rows, how do we store that data? Well, the most obvious format and most popular format is the comma separated value or CSV format or tab separated value or uh, whatever uh, separator you want to use, but basically text data that you have data in uh, organized with some separator uh, in, in columns. And it's, it's very popular because it's human readable and you can easily share it with people, but uh, it's usually not the best format for, for storing big data because uh, it, it can get really big. <laughs> like, if you think about how many bytes you need to store one number in in text versus how much how many bytes you need to store a number in in as a floating point value, it, mm -hmm. it it's a lot more when you had uh, multiple decimals there. But uh, it's very useful for especially sharing data with other people, and if you really need to see the data uh, yourself, mm -hmm. and Pandas has a really good interface for CSV files. Uh, so if you want to 
show how to write our example data set into a CSV. Yes, so the data set was the variable we made here. Yes. So it's a, it's a Pandas data frame. Okay. Yes, it and contains a lot of stuff. So what happens? So yes. did something happen? Yeah, it might go to a different folder based on what was your uh, working folder, the current working yeah. folder. But anyways, it will store like a CSV file that uh, you can then open up. Uh, yes. NumPy has an interface for CSV as well. Uh, so you can use this save TXT uh, to, to store NumPy arrays as a CSV. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I wouldn't recommend it uh, because of the uh problem with uh data uh, precision in uh in well csv so if you want to demo scroll a bit down to the and open the uh, csv uh ah yes this one. yes yes scroll okay. open the uh warning box there oh you see well we can yeah let's try the numpy Okay, so 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 the problem is that basically if you store numbers as text, like floating point values, if you have double sixty-four uh, bit floating point values, they have a lot of lot of precision. So you need to add a, or have a lot of decimals to store like a number. And if you're using CSV, it's very easy to like shorten the stuff up. So this is why I like I would never like use my own C like I have written myself like in in my time like csv writers so basically like just write text as floating point values with like four precision four decimal uh, positions of precision mm -hmm. and that can work if you actually know what the errors are in your data and that kind of stuff if you don't if you don't have error uh, like propagation but especially if you're working with like numerical code and stuff like that you usually want the intermediate products like stuff that you have uh, while you're working on the data, you want that to be uh, be exact. You want that to be exact. You want want it to be like a. Uh, so if if you want to like show uh, them this example, in this example, uh, like if you copy that, what this one? Uh, uh, yes, if you yep. copy that. To the... So in, in this example, we store like a NumPy square root of two. We store it as like with a simple Python writer. So we just write it as a floating point value. Mm -hmm. And then we load it back in from this like manually written CSV. We notice uh, that it's not the same. It's not the, exactly the same number. Oh. Uh, so if you try writing this, or running this, uh, you notice that there's an error. There's a like an well, it's not a big error, but uh, you you might have this. Yeah, it's an error and it will propagate. Uh, so if you like do something with your data and then you store it as a CSV and then you read it back as and and then you store it as a CSV, you might end up like propagating the error. And in some cases it doesn't matter, uh, but in in many cases you don't necessarily want to your code to do something you don't. Um, I would yeah. ever think if I was like in, into physics or something and yes. doing some quantum physics stuff, I would probably like to have no errors, preferably. Yes, yes. and that's why like uh, CSV is usually not the best format when you're like dealing with uh, like some intermediate data. Like you, 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 what you want to. But CSV is a good format for sharing data, and and if you need just need something quick and dirty, it's a very good format for tidy data, especially. Uh, but let's let's go. Uh, we have a, we're running out of time, so let's go a bit faster and go through a few of the like more important formats that you can use instead of CSV for tidy data. So one example of a format is this uh, feather format. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a format 
uh, that has been written uh, for like it needs an extra package called PyArrow, but it, it's a format that uh, can store like arrays temporarily very fast. It's very fast and very space efficient for storing like, uh, I mean, not arrays, but tidy data, but it's not usually the best format to store long-term data. And there is a, I would say better alternative, which is Parquet. Uh, and this Parquet format is, um, is a format made by Apache uh, Consortium, and it's mainly used in big data. It can store arbitrary data. So in big data, like warehouses, they store like arbitrary binary data in, in Parquet. But because it's designed for this kind of like big data stuff, uh, having using it that way requires a bit more technical knowledge. And I wouldn't maybe do it. Uh, if if you're not familiar with the format, but for tidy data, it is really easy. So if you look at the example, um, Pandas has a really good uh, interface uh, for Parquet. So you basically just have this to Parquet and from Parquet format. And so it's it's basically the same syntax as with the CSV yes. in Pandas. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Pandas has many of these to something and read something for uh, functions uh, that you can use to to write various different data formats. And it's this is a one good format for um, for uh, storing uh, data while you're working on it. So if you, if your data is in tidy format, it's very easy to do. It will require you to install the PyArrow package. I'm not certain if it's uh, included in the Anaconda distribution nowadays, but yeah, it's readily available. And it's this is a, it, it's an interoperable format for other other languages as well. Um, so it's it's very popular. Okay. So uh, okay, now that we have uh, looked at tidy data a bit, let's have a quick exercise of like writing something into a CSV. Uh, so that you can verify that this stuff actually works. Uh, so let's have like a like a five minute exercise, a quick exercise on uh, how to write a CSV file. Of course, you can use the Parquet example as well if you have the Pyro installed. But if not, then the CSV one is is uh, a good one to do. So let's uh, return in uh, forty seven. And and go through some array data then. Yes. Bye for now. Hello. So hopefully you managed to do the CSV exercise. These uh, exercises are really small and and uh, well, you can you can do them later on uh, because. Well, like mentioned at the start of the talk, there's a lot of these data formats, and there's no one of one good one uh, or one ex like excellent one. So, uh, like we have to go through many of them, so the exercises cannot reflect all of the available data formats. But you can you can run them later on if you find a uh, data format that suits you the best. But now that we have talked about tidy data, let's talk a quick about array data. So in array data, like you usually have like a big block of memory that you want to store as it is, like you want to store it as a binary floating point numbers in like a full block somewhere. And, and you want to like then recall it. You don't want to like have it stored as a CSV file or something uh, uh, because it, it will use a lot of, uh, it will use a lot of space. So uh, Instead uh, of storing it as a as a text file, you might want to use for something like a NumPy array format for storing like your intermediate results. Uh, so so uh, it's uh, it's included in NumPy. So it's a binary format and it stores like the array and and the corresponding metadata of what shape is the array and that kind of stuff. So you don't you don't need to store that as some in your CSV file as, as how to interpret the data. So if we try the example, it's a very easy thing to use. You have NumPy save and NumPy load functions that you can use to, to write uh, and read these arrays. 
Okay, so the file name and the object that we want to. Yeah, and it will save. it will like uh, it will store it much faster in much more small space than CSV file, and it will keep the precision definitely. Okay. Now uh, there's also in NumPy this save Z function that you can use to uh, store multiple arrays into one NPZ file. So it's like a gzip, like a compressed file that you can store multiple arrays into. So it's similar to like mat, uh, MATLAB's MAT file uh, in, in that sense with the user interface. Uh, mm. If you're familiar so... with that. Okay, so so you don't get like a, like hundreds or thousands of different yeah. files. Yeah. Yes, but uh, like I I would still like not store maybe thousands of files there, but but may but if you have multiple arrays, you can store stuff there, so you can you can then access it uh, later on. So you can then access the loaded in BZ as a, like a dictionary and get the array that you want to use. For yeah. really big arrays, it's better to use something like HDF5 or NetCDF that we'll be talking later on, because uh, you might want to want to access only a part of the array at a time. You don't want to access the full thing. So when you're using NumPy, NumPy load, you can do memory mapping or kind of, stuff, kind of stuff to access only part of the array, but usually it becomes complicated. So uh, those are more advanced tools or better tools for these kinds of use cases. Uh, NumPy save and save Z also work with spare uh, sparse arrays, so or sparse matrices. If you have like a situation where you have a really big matrix that is full of zeros and only once every now and then, uh, you can store it as a sparse matrix and then use the NumPy save and save Z to store it. And there's also like specialized uh, save functions in SciPy for uh, sparse matrices. So if that is your use case, I would use those. But when your when your data becomes bigger, when the arrays become bigger, like if you have physics code and stuff like that, you usually want to use some format that is also interchangeable with other tools because the NumPy format is NumPy specific. So you, if somebody else wants to use your data, then well, they are forced to use NumPy now. So that's no fun. Uh, and for that, like the most popular data format to share is uh, this HDF5 or hierarchical hierarchical uh, data format uh, version 5. So um, it stores, like you can store arbitrary data sets inside of it in, in this kind of like, like folder type situation. So you can create like these groups inside there and data sets there and you can put like arbitrary data there. And it, it has a lot of like complex features because it's been designed for the, like this uh, HPC applications uh, that can, might run like a huge number of uh, huge. Well, you can create like data sets of terabytes. And so, so and, and in one file, so uh, you need to have like a format that can support it. And but but it's and, not very and good. You, and you said that uh, hmm. it's it's in general. So your the receiver of the data is not locked to using NumPy. Yes, yes, it's okay. a general format you can store in various like uh, various uh, formats the data inside of it and 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 it's it's uh, shareable by uh, well you can share that format and anybody can read the format. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's it's not good for random reads though. So if you're doing something that depends on uh, random access like you want to randomly uh, go through something it's not very good for that but it's good when you want to do stuff in big blocks of data, mm -hmm. and uh, and there's a uh, few Python uh, packages that have good interfaces for that. Then we have NetCDF four, which is like a HDF HDF five, which is like like you have a um, HDF five with some sort of like how could I say it? Uh, you have a uh, you have a structure defined and it's it's very often used in the physics context where you have a uh, like time uh, space like if you have atmospheric data or something like that you have like a time dimension and then, then you have a spatial dimensions like three de spatial dimensions like x y and z coordinates and like it has uh, this well defined metadata thing happening inside of it it's built upon hdf5 but it's it's like has its own like 
conventions that are hard coded to the format itself. And it's it's useful if you are working with like programs that can accept net net CDF for. But yeah, so but these are special uh, formats. But it's good to be mindful of those. There's a really great package called XArray, which has good interface for uh, for net CDF for. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe we leave the exercise. We have we are running out of time, so maybe we leave the exercise three of saving the NumPy array as a, a home exercise. Um, okay, uh, this one uh, you can do it later on. And let's focus on. There's a really great discussion in the HackMD about JSON. Uh, so so one of the more modern and important data formats nowadays is JSON, because it's basically like. A, well, how could I say it? like CSV on steroids or something like that? So it's it's not it it can represent all kinds of stuff in it. It's a human readable format and it's very popular in in like web web storing web requests and all kinds of like relational data. Like if you have a, if you have something that comes from like you have a customer database and then you have a product database and so like databases and that kind of stuff where you have stuff that is related to each other. But so it's with what stuff the customer bought and uh, what kind of like, uh, yeah, who tweeted at who and and uh, who uh, what hashtags they were using and that kind of stuff. Like if you have data that is, is very like, uh, has lots of connections to other data, you don't want to like, create a tidy uh, data format out of it because the matrix would become so big and most of it would be empty. Like most of the stuff wouldn't have connections. But mm. if you have uh, stuff that is very uh, connected, uh, JSON is uh, very popular in that. Uh, Temu can probably answer more on this. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's JSON is kind of like an, it's like omnipresent nowadays. So if you're working with data or uh, data or similar stuff, then you probably encounter JSON every few minutes in some, in some format. So, um, uh, and like you said, especially with, with web development, it's very, all the data is basically transferred in JSON format. So it's yeah, very, yeah. very, very good to know. Good to know and and get familiar, I would recommend. Yeah, and I would also recommend like looking at like there's been lots of like a big info dump happening here. Like there's lots of different data formats. But uh, I would keep mind open about like what, what these formats are for because like even if you're dealing with let's say you're doing physics and you only deal with big arrays you still need some way usually to like keep track of what simulations you have mm -hmm. done what analysis you have done which parameters you have used to do these simulations and which arrays come from which simulations like the old-fashioned way is to like create folders and folders have like underscore underscore parameter value underscore and that kind of stuff i've done it myself and i'm i'm not ashamed to admit it but the better way would be to usually have like uh like something in a tidy tidy uh, format or maybe in a json file or something that would contain like these metadata these kinds of like uh contain the data and the relations between like what data sets you have what parameters you have used and which array data then corresponds to this uh to these parameters so you usually even if you're working with certain data format as like the that stores most of the data in in reality like most of the data is usually uh, what values were what code was you you were using to create this data or what what like so it's some sort of metadata like what parameters were you using what arguments were you using and that kind of stuff you don't want to store as an umpire array, right? Like that kind of stuff isn't suitable for that format. So, so usually you need to mix and match all of these formats. So you, you might have as a backend, like let's say HDF5 files store these big arrays, and then you would have like a JSON or something that would describe what's in the 
like what analysis you have done and which HDF5 arrays uh, uh, have have it like have the data you need. Of course, in some formats like Parquet and HDF5 and NetCDF they allow you to put metadata into the data itself, like right next to the data itself. But in many cases, like you need to mix and match all of these different data from. So it's good to know about them. Yes. But I, I think with that, like there's few other data forms mentioned there. There's Excel, which I won't recommend. Uh, but you, if you are doing something like social studies or economics or something, you have a lot of data. It's provided in Excel. Pandas has good interface for that. And then there's lots of like graph formats. So if you have a, uh, data that can be represented as a graph, you should check what the packages that analyze these graphs, what they recommend using. There's many different formats based on the uh, structure of your graphs. So uh, yeah, you should uh, look on that. But as, a, as a, like a summary, there is no one format to rule them all. You should think about how your code sees the data and and store the data in a way that uh that rep like is similar to how your code sees the data because then it makes everything a lot easier like i was and, thinking and, uh, and follow yeah. best practices and community practices yes like i was thinking an analogy of like you can you can send a vase to your friend in a letter like a letter in an envelope but then you have to break the vase into small bits and and at the other side, when your friend gets the <laughs> vase from the letter uh, letter envelope, they had to like glue it back together in order to like get the vase back. And you could just use like a padded box or padded like a uh, packaging uh, for sending it, and that would probably be a better format yeah. for sending it. So, yeah. so I get it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Richard, are we? Do we have a like a? I think we are at the end of the day. Yeah, so let's go to the notes. There is feedback already there, so you can let us know what you thought. Um, yeah, and let's see, any other questions to answer? Mm. There seems to have been a lot of issues this year with possible version conflicts or something like that, like something in the lesson requires newer versions than software people had installed. It's something we definitely need to look at for next time. Yes, we'll talk about versions tomorrow with the dependencies or or, or is it in Friday, but yeah, I think, uh, well, a lot of this is related to that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. So Friday, you'll see how to handle the versions and environments. <sighs> anyway, um, were there any more questions somewhere? What about this one? How can you make a simple file with modules to load parameters? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, one. Well, yeah, that's 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 like uh, I think you're now uh, in the in the ballpark where there is starting to become another format when you start implementing that, like. I've seen many, like especially in like uh, machine learning world or deep learning world, there's uh, many formats that try to like encapsulate like what environment we're using to create this model and also the model itself, and like having the software included with the um, um, mm -hmm. uh, in it, and it it comes yeah. can create. A, uh, become complicated but I, I think the question here is actually it that like how do you get the import statements yeah yeah okay the machine learning is the question so yeah yeah um, in in those like uh there's there's plenty of formats uh for one 
one common format is this ML flow that tries to like yeah. store it, but there's other yeah. ones as well. Maybe this is a good question to bring up in the panel discussion on Friday. Yeah. When yeah, we've I done think as well. all the things here, we can sort of put everything together and make mm -hmm. some better things. Because some like modules to load and imports, we see that Friday. Mm -hmm. um, we see about different libraries tomorrow and so on. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah, we need le less copying and pasting. It also slows us down. Okay, well, should we resume on uh, what's the next day? Uh, Thursday. At the same time of today. And we hope we see you there. Is there any preparation for tomorrow? I don't think there's anything extra, really. So, yeah. See you then. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Thanks.